This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you, Ruth. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so said, my name is Luis Monserrate. I'm a third year PhD student or candidate, I don't know how you say it. Uh, and today I would like to share with you the progress I've done for one of my dissertation chapters, which is mapping QPL and identified genes for seed and agronomic trait in a hemp F2 mapping population. But let's start with some clarifications. I'm not, familiar, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the hemp seed production and uh, processing and, and uh, commercialization, but that is sometimes referred as a grain hemp, right? But that is uh, erroneous because botanically speaking, the hemp seed is an akin and that's what I'm showing here on the upper uh, right corner is a picture of it. Uh, but it's also a very important again because of its nutritional content. You can see the breakdown on the left with a competitive oil content of about 35%, protein content of about 25 and fiber of 28% for this specific cultivar. Um, and because of that nutritional value, these uh, seeds upon harvest uh, is processed in uh, a process called de-hauling. And you see the breakdown of the holes and the sorry the, the removal of the hearts from the holes, meaning the collisions from the pericarp. Um, let's see if I can switch pointer. Um, and this heart, as well as the whole seed, can be milled uh, for a hemp flower, which can be later pressed or uh, N solvent uh, extracted for hemp seed cake, a hemp seed meal. Uh, getting some seed oil that can be used for uh, salad dressings, as well as you can get protein isolates that you can use for plant-based meats. Why am I telling you all of this? Well, earlier this year, uh, the FDA recommended uh, its approval as an ingredient in the diet of laying hens, uh, which can be, uh, will be done by the Association of American Feed Control Officials, officials later this year. Uh, so another thing, that really caught my attention uh, of the hemp seed is the size. And as you can see here, this is a phenotypic uh, variation of our available germoplasm, as well as the other market classes, such as fiber, flower, dual purpose, uh, as well as in the feral populations. So from an important standpoint, greater seed size could be beneficial for processing consumer preferences and anecdotally stand establishment and competition with weeds. Three years ago, um, a group out of Colorado State University, uh, Woods and Company, uh, crossed uh, this Italian cultivar Carmignola and Ukrainian cultivar USO31, uh, mapping several QTL for agronomic and biochemical traits. So since we're talking about seed size, uh, I just want to highlight that they identify four QTL in chromosome three, five, eight, and 10 for, for the, using the Finola uh, V2 reference genome. So when we convert to the most up-to-date reference genome, that would be chromosome two, one, nine, and X. Uh, but the most significant one was in chromosome one uh, with uh, expanding a region of 39 megabases. And on the right here, you can see the synteny of the chromosome five in Finola and chromosome one in CBDRX. Um, so it's a very large region, as you can see. So with all of this uh, background and previous work that has already been done, my objectives were to detect uh, significant QTL for seed size and anomic traits, and hopefully identify genes within the 1.5 load interval for each QTL. So to do that, in an effort to characterize part of mildew resistant, uh, two uh, cultivars, FP58 as resistant and TJCVD as susceptible were crossed, generating several F1s from which two were selected, generating two F2 populations. Hemp is highly heterozygous, so having more than one F2 population in a given cross will give you more likelihood of capturing uh, the effect of other alleles. Uh, so here we have two populations, namely 21-1004 and 21-1005. Uh, but besides polymildi resistance, as I said, other phenotypes were measured. And here I'd like to show you what it was observed. F58, for example, was five grams is smaller than TGCVD, and that's what I'm trying to show here, as well as the distribution of each of the F2 populations. In regards to flowering, TJCVD flower a week earlier than F58, and you can see the distribution of each of the F2 as well. And for biomass, F58 was 0 0.6 kilograms uh, smaller in biomass at the harvest. So with all of this phenotypic information, as well as the distribution of the different uh, the, the distribution differences between the F2 families, 
I decided to make a correlation plot. So here, one thing that clearly stands out is a negative correlation of terminal flowering and tass and seed weight and fresh biomass. So meaning that the earlier it flowers, the greater it gets, which is counterintuitive because as we know, once flowering is triggered, vegetative growth is halted for reproductive growth, which is a trend that we do see in 21-1005. For the genotyping, um, these progenies were genotyped using an Illumina array, using a total of 2,700 markers that were segregating in both F2 uh, families. And here on the left, you can see the market density for each of the linkage group, as well as the grouping based on recombination and linkage. Uh, you have the 10 groups corresponding to each of the 10 chromosomes in cannabis sativa. And to convert this genetic map to a physical map, the probe sequences were aligned to the CBDRX uh, genome that I mentioned earlier. So, uh, Doing a composite interval mapping, we observe a large peak in chromosome one, as well as other, uh, in other, other small, sorry, uh, smaller uh, peaks in, uh, along the genome. But there are several ways, sorry, not several, a few ways to analyze this data. Uh, one of them is to analyze both families together, which is something that you see here. Uh, but as I mentioned before, uh, hemp is highly heterozygous. So, some alleles could be segregating one population, but not in the other. So um, another way to analyze this data is to investigate each family separately, which is what I decided to do for this large peak in chromosome one. So focusing on that chromosome one, we see that the load score moved from 25 to 45 load score, <clears throat> explaining over 31% of the variance. And when we convert that to a physical map, that would be at the very beginning of the chromosome one using the CBDRX uh, reference genome. We look at the most significant market within that, within that 1.5 load interval uh, and look at and calculate the dominant stoative effect ratio, we see a dominant effect uh, for this marker. Now, when we look at the other family, 21-1005, it's not just that the load score in the PVE uh, was, uh, yeah, was much slower, compared to the 21-1004, but when we convert this result to the physical map, we see that it's on the opposite end of chromosome one, encompassing a much larger um, region and uh, more genes in that region. We look at the most significant marker in that peak, we see that the effect is partially dominant or additive, um, uh, as you can see here, due to the, um, the phenotypic distribution per allele group. So, Circling back to the QTL, um, sorry, yeah, to the QTL identified in uh, Wutterall, we are able to narrow down that region uh, from the 39 to uh, 642 kb, 30, sorry, 39 megabases to 642 kb, but we're also able to identify an additional QTL on the opposite end of chromosome one. But um, there were all the traits that I mentioned. So in this table, I'm also showing the mapping of all those other traits. And you can see already that consistently for tass and seed weight, terminal flowering, and fresh biomass in population 1004 and 1005, the most significant QTL uh, with the most percentage variance explained is located in chromosome one. So for the sake of time and this presentation, I'm going to focus on that chromosome one again. So, I already mentioned that for tass and seed weight, that QTL was located at the very beginning. So for terminal flowering and fresh biomass, that is also uh, it's a large um, QTL, and it's also located at the very beginning. And as you can see in the physical map, they overlap with the tass and seed weight uh, uh, in that sense. However, when we look at 21,005 for that most significant QTL, that QTL does not seem to overlap and explains a lower proportion of the variance. Uh, you can see that uh, based on the physical location, uh, pretty much the fresh biomass in between the terminal flower and tass and seed weight. So now when we look at the most significant marker for all of them, we see that the A allele um, in the 1004 family uh, seems to have an additive, sorry, dominant effect um, compared to the B allele, whereas in the 1005, the effect seems to be more additive partial dominant. So a total of nine QTL for tassan were identified, 
uh, because when we look at other families separately, there were extra uh, QTL in 1004 and 1005 uh, that we actually do not see when we combine two, uh, two of two families together. There were two QTL intensity weights identifying chromosome one for this population in 2021, one with a major effect as I showed and one with a minor effect. Uh, there seems to be a pleiotropic dominant effect QTL in chromosome one in the population 1004 uh, for that some C-way terminal flower in fresh biomass. However, it is still to be determined whether it's linked genes or it's a pleiotropic effect. And there are also like three separate QTL in 1005 with partial dominant negative effect for that some C-way flower in time in fresh biomass. So it is important to highlight that in a given cross, um, having having more than one F2 family will leave you more likelihood to capture the effects of additional alleles in that population, especially when you're dealing with a crop of highly heterocytes like hemp. And for future directions, I am narrowing down into those uh, QTL, like 1.5 load intervals, identify, to identify the best genes, identify the polymorphism of those parental alleles, and to see how prevalent it is in the uh, commonly, currently available cannabis genome sequences as well as look at effect sizes in other MAPI pedigrees that I'm dealing with and characterize those tasson sequel genetic mechanisms in uh, cultivars that have different market classes such as fiber, that belong to different market classes such as fiber and grain. So with that, hopefully within time, I would like to uh, acknowledge all the members of my lab as well as my funding sources. Yeah. Why are they putting hemp in chicken feed? <laughs> um, so, <laughs> So there are, I was showing the breakdown, but uh, there are several, um, especially the fatty acids, the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio being 2.5 to 1. So that's supposed to be the ratio that is healthy for human health. And probably I would imagine that's the main mechanism as well as the protein content in the seeds. But it's similar to soy, right? In all those it has less protein than soy. Uh, I'm not quite familiar about the omega, the fatty acids. Yeah, uh, for flowering time, especially if you look at distribution, there was like most of the individuals were flowering at the very beginning for one um, population, but for the other one, it seemed to be a very like normal distribution of flowering time. So that would be the main difference. Okay. Thank you, hello. Yeah, my name is Gregory Zinna. Uh, most people in Missouri Glad call me Gregor. Don't wanna get confused with Gregory Vogel either. But um, so uh, I am a research board specialist in Michael's lab and I manage the field and greenhouse program and I try to do my best to manage Michael as well. Um, so we do, uh, we have six different genera that we work with as well as uh, 16 different species. Uh, we do beans, peas, cucumbers, melons, watermelons, squash, and uh, peppers. Um, so, but today I'm here to talk to you about one particular species, Cucurbita moschata. Uh, I've been working to try and uh, find uh, the Q-tail responsible for uh, uh, novel powdery mildew resistance that we have found. Uh, so we're trying to find markers uh, so that we can more easily integrate this uh, powdery mildew resistance trait into uh, other cultivars. Uh, the, the novel resistance source uh, is not the greatest squash. Um, so as a, a reminder for all you, I know all, you have a lot of squash lovers out there, but there are three main species that are uh, grown in, in the United States and around the world. There's cucurbit of pipo, which is your jack-o-lantern, style pumpkins, acorn squash, delicata squash, uh, zucchinis, yellow squash, and then we have Cucurbita maxima, which is your giant pumpkins that get in the headlines a lot, and uh, also buttercup type squash and uh, kabocha squashes. And then finally, um, Cucurbita moschata, which is your butternut type squashes. And uh, there are some calabasa types that are grown quite frequently in the tropics, as well as some other Asian types. Um, the genome size is about 300 megabases, relatively small, uh, has 20 chromosomes. It acts as a diploid, but it's considered an allyl tetraploid. There was a genome duplication sometime in its past, so it, it can get a little messy. Uh, but so when growers are thinking about uh, trying to control for powdery mildew, 
Um, in the field, there's not much you can do about the environment. Powdery mildew comes in on the wind in, in late summer. Um, they have fungicides as an option. Um, and of course, uh, we, growers want to rely on host resistance as well. Uh, there's one uh, powdery mildew resistance gene that's available commercially right now. Uh, that was developed here at Cornell. Henry Munger introduced the PMO gene from Cucurba to Martin, Martinesii Okachibensis. Uh, over 50 years ago now. And if you um, buy any squash varieties that claim to have powdery mildew resistance, it's highly likely that they have this uh, gene. Uh, but it's a single dominant gene with some modifiers. Um, but uh, as we know, like having a single gene resistance is, uh, it can be challenging as we need to worry about uh, the pest overcoming this form of resistance. as actually happened with um, cucurbit 90 mildew and cucumbers uh, in 2015. So uh, here's um, an example of the different uh, susceptible and resistant cultivars we have. Uh, so on the far left is a waltham. Uh, that's a butternut, a susceptible individual, gets covered with powdery mildew on the leaves, stems, petioles, everywhere. On the far right is bugle. It has that PMO gene that I described. That's uh, in most Carissa's cultivars. And that primarily uh, gives powdery mildew resistance to the stems and petioles. Uh, the, it still gets powdery mildew on the leaf. Um, our novel powdery mildew resistance gets powder, uh, powdery mildew sporulation um, in just about nowhere. And nowhere on stems, petiole, or the leaves. And when we cross uh, waltham to our novel powdery mildew resistance, um, we see that uh, it gets the F1s either with the powdery mildew resistant uh, individual as a female or the male, uh, we get powdery mildew still all over the plant. And so it's definitely not a dominant resistance. Um, this was from a screen we initially did in 2022. Uh, we grew out 233 F2 individuals uh, along with all these controls. And we found about uh, we thought about at the time about 50 resistant individuals and um, I guess it was 183 susceptible. And so, uh, so then what I did was I did a bulk segregate analysis by taking the 22 most resistant and the 22 most susceptible individuals. We genotyped them using uh, uh, the aluminum 550, uh, 500-550 sequencing here at Cornell. And then I ran a bulk segregate analysis and um, using a QTL seq package and chromosome 13 up on the top right there seemed to have the greatest the correlation with this disease resistance. So we set out to start and find map the resistance in this uh, region. It's about a two megabase region uh, based on the my QTL seq. And uh, so I created markers all along this region and then using the remnant DNA from uh, the resistant individuals from that F2 population. Uh, I uh, ran all the markers on those individuals. I found a few of the individuals with crossovers, so I had an idea of where uh, the bounds of this resistance might be, since uh, it appeared to be a, a recessive resistance. Uh, and so I wanted uh, the area to be homozygous uh, for the resistant individual, and indeed it was for all of them. And so then I narrowed down the region and I used, and I was able to use the uh, marker 11 and one on that graph. And I used those, ran those markers on an additional 400 F2 and BC1 F2 individuals and found uh, an additional 50 individuals with crossovers, uh, planted them out in the field so that uh, so I could sell them down and get F23 families. And uh, in the end, I had about 39 uh, individual uh, F3 families that had enough seed. So then this past winter, we uh, planted out all these F3 families in the greenhouse and uh, went to town looking for resistant individuals. We had about 2,500 individual <laughs> different plants in this greenhouse. Uh, we also grew out an additional 400 or so F2s and some BC1 F1s uh, to try to get uh, a better idea of how this uh, resistance segregates. 
And so it is an immense undertaking. Um, but so what we found is we had some uh, fairly resistant F3s, but we also had some susceptible F3s that had the same um, region uh, that were homozygous for the resistant alleles. Uh, so we knew that there must be something else going on. We need one of the other alleles or one of the other QTL to uh, confer this resistance. Uh, and the family were segregating for uh, resistant, uh, powdery mildew resistance on all different surfaces, leaves, stems, petioles. Um, and in the BC1F1, that was a resistant by susceptible by resistant. Uh, if it was a single recessive gene, we would expect it about 50% of the individuals would be resistant, 50% susceptible, and instead it had about 12% that I was confident were, were resistant. So either somewhere between and a quarter and an eighth of the individuals are resistant. So there must be an additional gene or QTL that's uh, adding to this resistance. And so uh, thanks to Dr. Fay at BTI who gave us a, an updated reference genome, I was able to rerun the QTL seq. And I got uh, some of the other regions of the genome that hadn't really popped out before. Uh, seem to have a more significance using a Delta SNP index. So now I'm creating markers in those regions as well to try and um, sort out which of these uh, regions is responsible for that resistance. I have, rem or I have uh, tissue samples from all the uh, F3 families as well as the BC1, F1. And uh, I got my work ahead of me to run through, run a lot more markers. <laughs> so, um, so hopefully we'll, in the next year or two, we'll have marker package that we can put together so that we can uh, try and integrate this powdery mildew resistance into other uh, cucurbit moshata cultivars that, and uh, provide growers and breeders an additional source of powdery and mildew resistance. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank uh, everybody that's helped me in Mad Lab. Jack has helped me a lot with the genomics and I want to thank Michael and Anurag, my committee members, as well as we have a great undergrad crew that helps me plant all the seeds and and uh, take all the seeds out of the fruit and everything. And uh, the greenhouse crew and the uh, the farm crew are always a big help. And um, of course, uh, funding sources, QCAP and Molly John and uh, Munger Foundation. But anyone has any questions? Yes, sir. Curious for the disease scoring, did each plant part like stem, petiole, leaf get its own spore. And then when you did the QTL mapping, did the peaking chromosome 13 come up for all three of those plant parts? Um, so I did, yes, all the plants in the BC1F1, I gave uh, a score for each location. And uh, it seemed like you needed the petiole and the stem resistance to like, and then the leaf really showed up resistant. So it seemed to be there. It's uh, something um, you need that to get to the next step to have like the full resistance. But uh, so, yeah. And the question was if you need it, uh, if I had scored all the individuals differently with each location. <laughs> Did you see like a lag? Well, we didn't uh, for the um, for the individuals that had the QTL for the resistance, but uh, still were susceptible. Was there a lag in, in the development of the disease? We uh, so it's kind of hard to take multiple scores on all these plants. So I don't really have a, a AUDPC or anything for all the plants. We just kind of had to score the plants at about the fifth leaf stage and then uh, look at them again when we and I took tissue samples to confirm those results. So I don't really have like a real good like a developmental at some point because since we score them all in four inch pots, we have about five weeks and then the plants all start to kind of like peter out. So it's it's kind of challenging to do. Like look at the development. Yes. With the original population, all of Yes, the original population is all Mashada. This 
resistance uh, seems to be a native resistance. So uh, at some point, uh, maybe we'll be able to integrate this at a maximum of people, but uh, first we got to figure this part out. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.